I tried it with this 60s look. I tried. But my hair is too heavy to do any of the cute kind of like back poofs. And I don't have a bump it. Do you remember those? Do you remember those infomercials for bump it's? Bump it up with bump it. So didn't have one of those. This is the best we're gonna do with my 60s look. Ta-da! But also before we get into the topic of the video, I need to tell you guys a story. <laughs> so I was at Halloween Horror Nights the other night and we were going through the purge section. <laughs> Mind you, at this point I had had a couple of drinks, I was having a good time, I wasn't really feeling scared, which I was surprised by. Because with my past experience in my childhood when I would go to like haunted houses and stuff, I never did well. <laughs> but at Horror Nights, I was literally just living for it. There were a couple of mazes that did scare me though, the Halloween 4 one was excellent, but I'm getting off track. So I was going through the purge section. So basically one of the actors comes up to me and my friend with his big old knife and he kind of just shoves it in front of me and just like holds it there and like holds really intense eye contact. And because of this and because I'd had a few drinks and whatever, I was past the point of being scared because it was just kind of going on for an awkwardly long amount of time. And I didn't mean to say this, it just kind of slipped out of my mouth because he was staring at me really intently and I went, oh my God, are we flirting right now? Could not tell you what possessed me to say that, but there it is. There Here's my story. I'm hoping maybe because there was music and I was wearing a mask, maybe he didn't hear me, but who really knows? <laughs> Anyways, on to the topic of today's video. So today I'm doing my top 10 horror movies of the 1960s. But before I get into the list, I'm gonna be talking about all of the things that I learned while watching all these movies from the 60s. This was a tough decade for me to get through because I think I had only seen like three of these movies before, and I have 21 on my list. So I've spent the last several weeks just binging all these 60s horror movies. Prior to that, the 60s had been a huge blind spot in my knowledge besides like Hitchcock movies. And honestly, I've learned that it's not really the decade for me. I think that I enjoyed maybe like my top 12-ish movies, but a lot of them I probably won't revisit for a very long time, if ever again. Though I'm glad that I watched a lot of them. So anyways, some of the things that I learned, here we go. It was a very psychological time in horror. We were getting a lot more introspective. They were like, you know, we're tired of doing the monster thing from the 50s. Let's get into more internal fear and see how we can mentally break people. So we got movies like Carnival of Souls and Rosemary's Baby. Both are basically character studies concerning how we cope with mental illness. Of course, with Rosemary's Baby, we have some other stuff going on as well. <laughs> but rather than being big and loud and rah-rah monsters and nuclear ants and creatures in lagoons, we got a lot more horror of the mind. Because I think in the 60s, maybe people were getting a little bit more concerned with their own afflictions. Also, I feel like the social commentary was a lot stronger in the 60s. I mean, they were still doing the thing in the 50s. We got some pretty impactful movies, but then in the 60s, they got real jiggy with it. However, unintentional, I feel like a lot of 60s movies had some feminist undertones to them, but we'll get into that soon. One of the last things that I learned about the 60s is that this is, I feel like, when the haunted house ghost craze of horror kind of began. Because in the 20s, 30s, 40s, we got like a lot of Dracula movies, Frankenstein, things like that. We were still kind of on that monster-ish type of wave. And then in the 50s, they went all out with the monsters. And then in the 60s, we got into ghosts. And I speculate that it might be because of House on Haunted Hill from 1958. But then in the 60s, we got movies like The Haunting, Taste of Fear, 13 Ghosts. So you already know we have a lot of great movies to talk about concerning a lot of these themes. So let's just get into it. So I will actually be ranking all 21 of the 60s horror movies that I have ever seen, most of them having been seen in the last few weeks, so bear that in mind. I'll hold off on reading a synopsis and getting more detailed until I get into my top 10, so if you want to just skip past that, hopefully I have some timestamps linked down below. But coming in at number 21 would be Dementia 13. This falls dead last because I couldn't even finish it, and the guy that made this movie went on to make a little movie, just a small indie flick, called The Godfather. I need to stop making that joke. I absolutely have to stop making that joke. I did the same thing in my last video when I was talking about Tenet, but I see an opportunity to make a film bro mad and I just have to take it. So anyways, that was one of his first ever feature films and our first projects are likely not gonna be our best. So I don't hold that against him. I've also never seen The Godfather, so... <laughs> You can also throw that on the list of things to say to make a film bro mad. But anyways, I made it about an hour into that movie, but it was just so messy and not compelling, so I turned it off. Up next, coming at number 20 is The Atomic Brain. This is also one that I couldn't finish, but fun fact, this is a movie that I watched repeatedly as a child. I could not tell you why. There are a couple other movies in here that I watched all the time when I was a kid. And for some reason as a child, I loved it, but watching it now, it is a very poorly made movie. The quality is 
oh my god, it's so terrible. And in fact, the bad quality was just so distracting that I turned it off after I think like 10 minutes. I remember really liking it as a child, but I was a child. So I know the movie, like I basically know what happens, but I also looked on Letterboxd for other reviews just to kind of clarify what I was experiencing now. And yeah, the general consensus is it's not a very good movie, so I don't think you're missing out on much if you don't watch it. Coming in at number 19 would be Spider Baby. I feel like this movie more or less laid the groundwork for movies like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. There are some standout performances if you're a fan of Sid Haig, who I think is most well known for being in House of a Thousand Corpses. He is in this movie, but it's really weird. It was just a really weird movie. I did have fun with it at certain parts. There were some standout performances, but it's just really weird. I wasn't really that compelled either, so I feel like it's one you can skip. Coming in at number 18 would be Eyes Without a Face, and this one was recommended by What a Ghoul Wants or my friend Anna. I honestly thought that I would like this one more. I think that I did give it three or three and a half stars out of five, and it was a good movie. I really did enjoy the story of it, but it's just a very slow burn. There was also some gore that was pretty heavy for the time. I think the effects are really good and they still hold up, but other than that, I think it was just a little bit too slow for me. Coming in at number 17, we have a movie called Blow Up, and this was one that I actually studied for one of my sociology classes. This is not really a movie that I enjoyed, but I feel like it's a movie that had a lot to say. It's super unique. Was it successful in all of the messaging that it was trying to get across? I don't know because I feel like the movie is a little bit pretentious, but it's a bit higher because I did enjoy the movie a bit more than the other movies, and also it's highly unique. I don't think I've ever seen another movie that's quite like it. Coming in at number 16 is a movie called Black Sunday. If you want to watch a movie that's simply just beautiful, if you love a good gothic style, then this is probably the movie for you. I thought that the premise was really interesting, but then the preceding story was just a little bit bland for my taste. I know that the pacing of movies was a bit different back then, but also there's movies that are older than that that I felt like were better with their pacing, so I don't really see that as an excuse. The movie, again, is just a little bit too slow for me. But if you want that beautiful gothic style, if you want a movie about a witch, then go for it. Coming in at number 15, we have The Comedy of Terrors. This is a really, really weird movie. It's supposed to be a dark comedy, and I think that I let out a brief puff of air from my nose maybe twice when I was watching this. It never got a laugh out of me because whenever it's trying to be funny, it is painfully obvious, and it's just, I don't think it's funny at all. It also stars one of my favorite boys, Vincent Price, but he is playing this like very abusive and annoying person in the movie. He's this drunk that is constantly just yelling at his wife, like verbally abusing her. And worse things than that do happen because of his character. So as a big Vincent Price fan, it's kind of hard to watch him like that. But even though I didn't really find it funny, I still think that there is a good amount of entertainment value. It's just hard to say if I recommend it because a lot of the verbal abuse is really hard to sit through and it happens within the first 10 minutes of the movie. But after that, things get marginally better. <laughs> Coming in at number 14 would be The Haunting. So this movie, I definitely rated it a bit lower than some of the other movies that I ranked lower on this list, but it's just because this movie, again, was really slow and it took me like four days to finish it because I think it's over two hours long, but it is a good movie and it's also really, really gorgeous. Again, the cinematography is just incredible. Also, there's a character in the movie that I'm pretty sure is queer because I felt very represented by her. So it had a couple of things going for it, and I do recognize that it is a really good movie. It just was kind of boring to me. Up next, we have The Innocence. The Haunting of Bly Manor was essentially a remake of this old movie, and I have to say that I do prefer the movie. The show stretched out so many things that just really didn't need to be, and this movie proved to me that this type of story was a lot more well-contained within just a two-hour movie. So yeah, if I ever was in the mood for Bly Manor-related content again, then I would watch this movie. I probably would not wait my time watching this show again. Also, I changed my mind because we're getting to the top 12 now, and I actually do want to read the synopses for all of these 12 movies, so I'm gonna start doing that now. So finally, sorry, I know it's taken a while, but coming in at number 12, we have a short film, actually, that's called The Alphabet. This was directed by David Lynch. A woman's dark and absurdist nightmare vision comprising a continuous recitation of the alphabet and bizarre living representations of each letter. I believe I said on Letterboxd that I was surprised that someone didn't call me and inform me that I was gonna die in seven days after watching this short film, because that is how cursed it feels. As you just saw briefly, right? This movie is a lot. <laughs> Even though this movie is only four minutes, it kind of feels like a lifetime when you're watching it. We studied a lot of David Lynch and experimental cinema when I was in school. If you couldn't tell by what you just saw, he was kind of a trailblazer in experimental cinema. So I definitely wanted to be sure to watch it for this ranking video, but I had no idea how that movie was gonna hit me. And it hit me like a 
shit ton of bricks. <laughs> but we're not even to the top 10 yet, so I should move on. Coming in at number 11, maybe a bit surprising, would be Rosemary's Baby. A young couple trying for a baby move into a fancy apartment surrounded by peculiar neighbors. So I've spoken before about this movie and how I just personally won't rewatch it, knowing what I know now about Roman Polanski. But if you're somebody that can watch a movie and not get distracted with intrusive thoughts about the director and the horrible crimes that he's committed, it's a good movie. Obviously, it's very famous. As I mentioned, it's kind of a character study on mental illness. Also, definitely a study on domestic relationships and gaslighting and other stuff like that. And the ending is bizarre. If you know, you know. But when it comes to being a film buff, I don't even know if this is one that I would say is worth seeing. Sure, it was groundbreaking for the time. I'll give you that. I guess it's important in the context of film history, but there are better movies out there. It mostly makes it so high up on this list because of Mia Farrow and her performance. I adored her in that movie. That poor woman. Oh my god, she just went through so much, didn't she? But I'm gonna move on now because I've been filming for almost a half hour, and so it's definitely time to finally get into my top 10 horror movies of the 1960s. So coming in at number 10 would be Whatever Happened to Baby Jane? Jane Hudson is an aging child star left to care for her wheelchair-bound sister Blanche, also a former child actress. Stuck living together in a mansion in old Hollywood, Blanche plots to get even with Jane for the car crash that left her crippled years earlier. This movie stars Betty Davis and Joan Crawford, just two absolute icons of the time. Obviously, the acting is phenomenal. I think that's really what drew me into this movie. Also, for the most part, the entirety of the story is very compelling. I do think it is a little bit too long. It comes in at about two hours and 10 minutes or something like that. In my opinion, that's just a little bit too long, especially for a 60s movie. But that being said, I also did just a little bit of research into this movie, and apparently Betty Davis and Joan Crawford had somewhat of a rivalry at the time because they were both massive stars. The director wanted to use this to his advantage because they are playing two rival sisters. And I don't know if that's true, but if it is, then it definitely read on screen. I thought that it was phenomenal. Their relationship was really what made that movie. Betty Davis makes an excellent villain. I think that the plot was super interesting. It took a lot of interesting turns. It's just a good movie. It's a good movie. Coming in at number nine would be 13 Ghosts. This is directed by William Castle. A family inherits what proves to be a haunted house, but a special pair of goggles allows them to see their ghostly tormentors. A little bit of spoilers for this video, I am going to be talking about William Castle a couple more times because I've learned that I love his movies. He was a big director in the 60s, he also was the director of House on Haunted Hill, and he has a very distinct style. A lot of his movies are just a lot of fun. This one especially, even though this movie is kind of a mess, it's just a little bit all over the place, it is so much fun. One reason why I really like it so much is because I really feel transported as a 60s audience member. The reason for that is because in the beginning of a lot of William Castle's movies, he does this thing where he speaks to the audience. He did the same thing for The Tingler, where there's kind of like a disclaimer at the beginning of the movie. But for this one in particular, he was telling the audience how to use these special colored goggles that you could use while watching the movie. So yeah, that doesn't make the movie age the best in terms of future audiences watching it, but I still think it's really funny. And the way that the ghosts look in this movie, it's just so hilarious. And the way that the people react to the ghosts, they literally just kind of stand there and stare at them. And I think it's because audience members would probably also want to do the same thing and look through the goggles and see the special effects and stuff. But when it comes to the pacing and the realism of the acting and stuff like that, it's just so ludicrous. But again, that just makes the movie a lot more fun. The standout character to me was definitely, I think her name was Hilda, but she was like the old caretaker of the house. She was fantastic, had a wonderful spooky energy. She was sort of like a medium for the spirits. And it's hard for me to elaborate why William Castle's movies are so much fun fun, but they just have so much energy. And also I just get this distinct feeling that all the actors are really happy to be there. I don't know what it is. I don't know if I really recommend checking this one out just because it has all the weird outdated stuff, but for me that's a lot of fun. I don't know about you, so do with that what you will. Coming in at number eight, that would be The Brain That Wouldn't Die. This is a weird one. A doctor experimenting with transplant techniques keeps his girlfriend's head alive when she is decapitated in a car crash. Then he goes hunting for a new body. This is also a movie that I watched so many times in my childhood. I loved this movie as a kid and that just sounds so unbelievably morbid, but I did. It was part of this four pack with these other 60s horror movies in it. It also had Carnival of Souls, The Atomic Brain, and then there was one more, I think it was called like Ghost Ship. But yeah, this movie was on repeat when I was about six or seven years old. <laughs> this is also one of those movies that I feel like has very feminist undertones, but it's hard to tell if that was the intention. It's hard to tell because it is still very male gaze heavy. You are put in perspective 
perspective of the man that is checking out all these women to find a new body for his partner. But that being said, let's, let's look at the material. Even though we were viewing the world through his lens, this scientist main character was not portrayed as romantic. He was an asshole. Never at any point are you left rooting for him. When presented the opportunity to find his fiance a new body, he immediately goes to a strip club. He didn't even stop and think, you know, hey, maybe, maybe my wife should choose her own body. <laughs> there are just so many layers of commentary to this movie that I don't even think were meant to be there. That's just one example. You also have the decapitated head of his fiance and she is kind of pulling the strings in the situation. She's very easily able to manipulate his lab assistant and also this mysterious monster that he has locked in the closet. And she repeatedly has lines of dialogue where she just blatantly acknowledges how much power she has, even just as a head. Which I feel like was just inherently empowering for women because it's true, like we don't even need a body to control men. <laughs> So that juxtaposed with this scientist that is so distracted by trying to find another new beautiful body and bam, a feminist movie is born. <laughs> Unless the intention really was to have the scientist be the protagonist that you root for, in that case, then it's just so funny because it is so violently sexist that it ends up being feminist. How does that work? I'll just let you figure that one out. Okay, we still have seven to go. Coming in at number seven would be Night of the Living Dead. Maybe surprising that it's not higher up on the list. It is a very famous movie, but even so, let's just read the synopsis. A disparate group of individuals takes refuge in an abandoned house when corpses begin to leave the graveyard in search of fresh human bodies to devour. This movie didn't make it up higher on my list because it left me feeling so sad. Also, there was a decent amount of this movie that I felt like just really needed to be trimmed out. I don't feel like the pacing was even enough between the action and all of this painful dialogue of just a bunch of people fighting in a house. Also, I really liked the male lead, but I really did not like the female lead. She just really bothered me. She annoyed me very much. So it was hard to like that movie for that reason. But of course, it's probably the most iconic zombie movie of all time. I do give it credit for that, as well as the very progressive commentary that is in the movie. Even if that wasn't intentional, I mean, who knows? I mean, you would never really see a black man as the protagonist of a movie, especially not in the 1960s. So I really don't know if that giant bombshell moment in the end of the movie was intentional for its social commentary but looking back now, oh yeah, we, we can see it. It's kind of bonkers to me that a movie that is about 60 years old is still so relevant in that regard. I don't want to say explicitly what the commentary is because it's a big spoiler for the ending of the movie and if you haven't seen it, you should. So anyways, I'm just going to move on to my number six and that would be Homicidal. This is another William Castle movie. Chaos and danger reign when Miriam Webster meets her half-brother's girlfriend, Emily, a mysterious blonde living at their family's Southern California estate. This movie is mainly known because it is somewhat of a psycho copycat. A lot of people feel that way, and honestly, I do share that sentiment, but I think that this movie is a lot more fun than Psycho. I mean, as I mentioned with William Castle, he just injects a lot of energy, and I just always have a good time with his movies. This movie might be a little bit predictable, but I do think it's worth seeing because the performances are a lot of fun. But if you don't want to see the more lighthearted and fun version of Psycho, and you just want to stick with Psycho, that's fully understandable. Coming in at number five, this one was recommended by a lot of people, that would be Carnival of Souls. Mary Henry ends up the sole survivor of a fatal car accident through mysterious circumstances. Trying to put the incident behind her, she moves to Utah and takes a job as a church organist, but her fresh start is interrupted by visions of a fiendish man. This movie is super bizarre, and as I mentioned, it is kind of a character study on mental illness. I really enjoyed this movie, so much so that on my Letterboxd review, I said, Night of the Living Dead Who? It's kind of hard to talk about what I liked about this movie because because I would just end up giving too many spoilers, especially if I expanded upon what I meant by Night of the Living Dead Who. I think you should really just find out for yourself. This movie made me feel really uneasy. I think it builds its tension really well. It sets up this really delicious mystery and the story is super rich and then you get this kind of crazy twist ending. But I also love the lead. I adore that she plays the organ because the music provides such an eerie, spooky backdrop for a lot of the scenes of the movie. And the visions of this man that she sees, I think they really hold up. They're 
are really spooky. I think that this is definitely a good one to watch around Halloween time. So consider popping this one on this month. Up next, coming in at number four, time to upset the film bros again, and that would be Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock. Phoenix secretary Marion Crane is on the lam after stealing $40,000 from her employer in order to run away from her boyfriend. Traveling on the back roads to avoid the police, she stops for the night at the Ramshackle Bates Motel and meets the polite but highly strung proprietor Norman Bates. Hopefully most of you guys have already seen this movie, so you already know why it's so high up on my list. I adore this movie, but the reason why it doesn't make it higher up is because I feel like it just sags a bit in the middle. There is just a little bit too much dialogue, a little bit too much dancing around. I feel like the movie could be trimmed down quite a bit, especially because of the initial setup of the story and what ends up happening to our lead character. I just don't really think it's worth all of that extra fluff, but I will say, of course, Hitchcock is, you know, the master of suspense. It does build the tension really well in the story. I just think that it would still be well built if some of that was trimmed out. I don't feel like I need to go on too much about Psycho. I feel like most people already know there is a reason why it is so famous. It's, it's a great movie, so I don't need to talk to you like I'm telling you brand new information. Let's move on. Coming in at number three would be yet another William Castle movie, Straight Jacket. Though still mentally shaky, convicted axe murderess Lucy Harbin is released from the asylum where she was sent 20 years ago for slaying her unfaithful husband. Lucy goes to stay at her brother's farm and reconnect with her grown daughter Carol, who saw her mother chop her father to pieces as a tot. So I have a lot of praises for this movie, but right off the bat, you should know that this is a fairly predictable movie. But in my experience, I knew the ending coming a mile away, but that being said, it did not stop any of my enjoyment of the movie. I thought it was phenomenal. I had such a great time watching this movie. This is one that I actually think I will rewatch. It's not really doing anything groundbreaking. There also are a little bit of psycho elements to the movie, but it just has good energy. It has good vibes. Joan Crawford is also obviously amazing in the movie. I don't think I've seen her in anything else, but I am wanting to explore more of her filmography now after seeing Straight Jacket and whatever happened to Baby Jane. This movie also definitely has slasher energy. I don't know why this one is not accredited as a great early slasher. Maybe it's because you don't see too much. It is pretty heavily censored, but also like it was the 60s. I forgot to mention, there's also a fright break in this movie. They put like a clock timer kind of a thing up on the screen within the last, I don't know, 10 minutes of the movie. And it's basically so that any audience members that are too scared can leave before the end of the movie happens. I just think that's too funny. It's very cute. This is a movie that I highly recommend, especially if you enjoy slashers, if you enjoy older movies, if you haven't really seen any movies from the 60s, I definitely recommend popping this one on. Okay, coming in at number two, that would go to a movie called Taste of Fear, also known as The Scream of Fear. A wheelchair-bound young woman returns to her father's estate after 10 years, and although she's told he's away, she keeps seeing his dead body on the estate. Oh, what a movie. Now, this movie definitely had some Hitchcockian vibes with the suspense, but it is a lot shorter than Psycho. That's why it made it up higher on my list, because I think the pacing is very concise. I didn't really think that there was any fat to be trimmed off of this movie. It was just a very effective story through and through and extremely captivating. It maintained my attention for the entire duration of the movie, which the same cannot be said for a lot of the other movies on this list. It also stars Christopher Lee, if you're a fan of him. And this is a movie that is not predictable. I don't want to give anything away, but what you think the movie is might not really be what, what it is, What you know? At any point when I thought that I had a handle on what was going on in the story, they would switch something up and subvert my expectations. In that way, it almost gave me Jordan Peele vibes a little bit in the way that he constructs the plots of his movies. So if you're a Jordan Peele fan, you might really enjoy this one. It's also gorgeous. It takes place in this big estate, which I guess that's another thing that I should have included in the what I learned portion of the video. They loved filming in big old fancy mansions in the 60s. So not only do you have great acting, a great really compelling story, but it's also gorgeous. It's a really pretty movie. And that's also one that I think is really underrated because I looked up a lot of top 10 lists to kind of try to cultivate the best list that I could of movies to watch. And I don't think that this was on most of those lists, but it should be. Anyway, I think that that's enough said. Let's just move on to my number one movie of the 1960s. If you've been around, you could probably guess, but my number one goes to The Birds, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Melanie Daniels meets Mitch Brenner in a San Francisco pet store and decides to follow him home. She brings with her the gift of two lovebirds and they strike up a romance. But suddenly, a huge assault begins on the town by thousands of attacking birds. Now, I have to get out of the way that Alfred Hitchcock, honestly, is kind of a piece of shit. Like, yeah, he made some great movies, but his methods were nothing if not 
questionable. That's putting it very lightly. I'll have to see if I can find the article that I read where she was interviewed about him. So hopefully that'll be linked down below. But all of that aside, The Birds is a movie that, again, I had on repeat as a child. It was one of my favorite movies when I was young. The Birds, The Brain That Wouldn't Die, The Atomic Brain, Arachnophobia, all on loop, okay? <laughs> I think the reason why I have to put it up at number one, I mean, not only because of the nostalgia, because I've seen it so many times, but secondly, I think that the location was super unique. It takes place in Bodega Bay, which is actually somewhere I've been a couple of times. I've taken pictures in front of the bird's house. I also was there recently, and they now have a cafe that's called the Bird's Cafe, so I hope to go there someday anyways. Gorgeous, really unique location for a horror movie. Also, very unique concept. Something that I never really thought that I would ever fear is birds. I still don't really, but to this day, whenever I see a giant flock of birds crossing the sky, I think, oh, the birds. And pretty much every time without fail too, I'll take a video and I'll send it to my family and be like, ooh, it's giving me the birds out here. <laughs> That's how much of an impact the movie had on me, very similar to Jaws actually. But I feel as though sharks, especially great whites, are inherently scary, whereas birds, they're so commonplace in our lives. You and I probably see a bird or two every single day of our lives. So to think, hey, what if all of these creatures suddenly started attacking us? What then? That was crazy. That was bonkers. The movie is also pretty brutal, and I think a lot of that does still hold up. And it's basically the opposite of a good for her movie. You know how with Midsommar at the end, you know, it's horrible, but you still can't help but thinking, you know, good for her. You basically have the exact opposite feeling at the end of The Birds. And for that reason, it's a movie that you might think about for a couple of days after you finish watching it. Definitely a think piece, even though it's not really that psychological, it's more of a straightforward creature feature, honestly. I just think that it's cool that after the 50s, Hitchcock was thinking, you know, we had big monsters, but what about all the monsters around us in our daily lives? What if bird bad? That's a thing that Stephen King often does, you know, what if car bad? What if dog bad? bad? What if hotel bad? So they did that with birds for the birds and it worked out really well for them. But all of that is just my opinion. If you don't have a top 10 from the 60s, maybe just let me know your favorite movie of the 60s or your top three. A big shout out to my patrons. We just got a new member the other day. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for supporting me. All my info, other social media, that'll all be linked down below. Also let me know what original versus remake comparison I should make for the 60s. I've kind of already started a script for 13 Ghosts because the remake came out in 2008 five and it stars Matthew Lillard and I think it's hilarious. But thanks for sticking it out to the end of the video. I hope you subscribe, click the notification bell so you know whenever I upload my next video. And that is all. That's the end. That's peace.